Hello YouTube, today we're going to be discussing medieval lifting wisdom. Once again, in my effort to look at our past and find things that we can learn from, I've decided to direct my sight towards the Middle Age as a general period, because as we'll understand, it's quite large. It lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. And when it comes to the type of people we're going to observe, we're of course going to mostly be focused on knights. Although, you will see that to introduce this topic, we have to make a pit stop at the common man, because there is also a lot to learn from the non-militarized population of the time, as they were much tougher than we are nowadays. If we are to understand these people, and it's my belief that it also applies to the Greeks and the Romans, we should also first look at their myths and their legends. I think that you can learn a ton from looking at the tales and the stories that people, a common culture, tell each other. Because usually these tend to share ideals, ideals that the common population will try to attain, they will look up to. It's what I personally call the male power fantasy. And these are of course of usually present under the form of myths, so in Greek, ancient Greece, for example, it was poesy, mythical poesy. Everything that could, in a sense, exaggerate reality to make for a grandiose scenery that would greatly inspire the population. Because every single culture, if you take a quick look at their written history, always shares these legends and these tales of fictional heroes that had with in mind the idea and goal to inspire the common population and make them reach for higher heights. In a sense, they presented them with an ideal to attain. It is also my belief and pet theory that if you want to diagnose the perdition and the just degeneration of a culture, you can simply look at what happens to their tales and their myths. If the type of person that they worship goes from the hero to someone who is mediocre or who promotes sinister or degenerate values, that is also going to reflect on the common person. And that is exactly what is happening to us with modernity, with celebrities, with whoever is now the thing that you are supposed to look up to and that led us to be completely mediocre. So... What were the legends of the past? What were the legends that, that the common man during medieval time looked at? Well, in France, for example, because we're going to focus on Europe for this episode, it was La Chanson de Geste. La Chanson de Geste was always the same thing. It was a story about battles, about warriors, about les faits d'armes, the great feats of strength that were demonstrated by knights of the time, by men, by men of value. And an example I can give you is La Chanson de Guillaume. And if you look at, a, at La Chanson de Guillaume, it is something that we could still nowadays utilize to motivate young men, meaning that what got the blood flowing back in the days, seven, eight hundred years ago, still functions to this day. Guillaume was essentially a massive child. He was extremely tall. He was very muscular, very strong. He was glutinous, he was good with the ladies, he had every single trait that are desirable in a male. And across the board, it's something that you always see. It's that ideal to obtain, it's that male power fantasy. So, this is what the average man had in lieu of motivation. So, let's look at what it did to them. What happened to these people? How did they live when they had such legend to follow and look up to? Well, unlike what we might think now, they are not and they were not the, the miserable, the wretched, the idiotic, the frail people that modernity has painted them as. I'm sure that if you listen to any account of medieval times, you have a pretty downthrown idea of what these people are like, of the common folk at the time. You most likely take them again for just dirty peasants. But this is far from the truth. In reality, I believe that we have much to learn from our ancestors and that the hubris of the modern man who thinks that because he came afterwards, he most likely by default is better, is mostly fabrications. You have more knowledge than them, but that knowledge comes from the fact that you live in a digital era. It's not your intelligence. It's the fact that information is easily available. 
what you might be lacking entirely, however, is wisdom. And it's that lifting wisdom that I want to summon back from medieval times. So let's look at the life of the common man and let's look at physical development and the importance it had in these people's life. If we are to understand why physical development was so prevalent back in the days and so important, beyond the myth and the fact that people just wanted to get jacked and strong because it was cool and it, it just sounded legendary in their ears, we also have to look at the time period and its characteristics. To me, medieval times are characterized by two aspects, discomfort and danger. Life was not easy and life was potentially ending at any given moment, meaning that it was tough. It was a tough time to live through. Life was hard. And if you want a stat to prove that, back then, 35% of people died before the age of 20. So if you managed to make it to adulthood, you were already part of the survivors. You managed to surmount the great filter, meaning that only the strong survived, only the ones that were prepared survived. Food also wasn't abundant, something that we don't know anymore, at least in developed quote-unquote countries. Back then, food wasn't a given. You had to earn your food, you had to work for your food. And if something went wrong, there was la famine, and people just died. People just starved to death. And children were not protected from that, meaning that we've all heard the tales of parents who have to sacrifice a kid because if they don't, the entire family is going to die off. That was... Of course, uh, not very um, PG of them, and we would find this abhorrent nowadays, but when it comes to survival of the community, sometimes you have to sacrifice the individual. So the only individuals that made it were the ones that were incredibly strong. The weather also made sure that men had to be tough because there was no real protection from weather. If it was really cold or really warm, there was no hazy. There was no heating systems to protect you. There was your house and that was it. Maybe blankets if you were lucky. But if there was a particularly rough winter, not only were wolf, wolves coming into the village to feed, but on top of that, you were going to freeze your balls off. So if you had a poor immune system or no ability to survive, you would just die. And from what I just said also, keep in mind that back then, man was still part of the food chain. Nowadays, you walk in downtown New York, there's not going to be a fucking bear that is going to come from behind the lamppost to just snatch and grab you. But now, it's because we have just made nature into our bitch. Back in the days, they still lived with nature, and with that comes also the possibility that one day, nature is going to get back at you. So, being killed by an animal and eaten by one was still in the cards. It was a death like another one. And if you want to survive that, you better be able to fight off the animals. So, again, only the strong survived. And that also meant that people had an incentive to be strong, something that I think has mostly disappeared nowadays. Many people get to be physically weak because we have so many amenities, we have so many transportation systems, we have so many systems put in place to preserve people who don't have the ability to do things themselves, that there is no real motive. Back then, the motive was... If you want to be alive, you better be fit. You better be strong. It wasn't just something that we did for status symbol or to Instagram it. Back then, physical development was a prerequisite to survival. So, of course, most everyone did it. People trained. And they didn't train the way we train nowadays. Most of their physical development came from working manual jobs. But, and that's something that's mostly ignored and that people don't actually take into account... People also exercised for fun, meaning that people who would work all day in the fields or wherever they worked, and then they would also train by their own volition because they understood that if they developed their fitness outside of their working hours, they would be more performant during the working hours and it would also greatly boost their survival. And if you look at, again, the common peasant back then, usually the type of things that they prefer to do and their favorite methods of exercising were running, wrestling, and throwing, meaning that they would run, they would jump, they would fight each other, they would wrestle each other, and they would throw things. Quite literally, just pick up rocks and throw them. And this sounds, again, like basic, basic caveman s s savage shit, but it was effective. You don't need fancy equipment to develop your body, you just need the willingness. And people back then had a lot of willingness, so they got it done. And it's 
it's particularly fascinating to see also that it wasn't just the common folk. It wasn't just poor people that were interested in developing their body because you could tell me, hey, this means that people who had more comfort didn't need that because they were protected. Well, understand that even though the people of back then were not inferior in every aspect compared to what we have now, they were still greatly inferior in the aspects of protection and comfort. They had none of that. So it's easy to say that even the poorest person that lives nowadays in a first world country has more comfort and protection than someone who was extremely rich and influent from back then. And so this also means that the aristocrats also partook in physical development. But because there was a difference in social status, they did it different ways. What they enjoyed particularly was the what we call water sports. Uh, I also know that this is a euphemism for a different thing, so don't get me confused. And they also, of course, practiced the art of weaponry. They would fight one another, whereas the common peasant had no access to weapons, so he, he had to do with what he had, sticks and rocks, etc. And all of that participated in a common effort to develop the body. A development that didn't stop at just adults, because children were also included. Children were motivated and children were also pushed towards developing their body because it was believed that they had to become physically tough before cultivating their mind, meaning that it was a prerequisite, right? Before you start filling up your coconut, you better develop a body that can protect it. Nowadays, it's the exact opposite. We are the complete bizarro contradiction and just inversion of that wood. And it's because we don't live in the same wood. There's not as much as an incentive to become tough because the environment is softer. So we get to just skip the physical development and go directly to the spend eight hours a day sitting on a chair, listening to teachers that you can barely understand. But I believe that we went overboard because this is not doing anything for us and for the youth in particular. We have just completely just forsaken physical development. Nowadays, you spend two hours a week in PE and that's it. That's not enough. There should be a return to physical education because I believe that people back then had a point. It makes a ton of sense to develop the body first. You want children to be in tune with their bodies. They will have time afterwards to develop their intellect. Of course, there's no need to go overboard. They can do the, 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 the two at the same time. But uh, during those days and during that time period, it was just, again, necessary for survival. It didn't really matter if a kid could speak properly or if he could count to five. What mattered is that he had to be able to defend himself because the adults were not always there to protect them. And so they had to be independent from a young age. And what can be more conducive to independence than developing a strong and resilient body? I believe that this is the key also to emancipation. Once you have a body that can be serviceable and functional in every situation, the confidence that it's going to bring up there is going to be unmatched. That is what was built back then. It was because the body was at the center of everything. They first, they, they firmly believe that the body was what started the rest and that there was no point in having a developed mind in a completely undeveloped body. So this also reflected in the way they treated children. And this was also mostly because man back then still lived amongst nature, which we don't do anymore. And which also explains why our modern age puts more accent on cerebral development as I already said, to the detriment of man as a whole. Now, it was to the point back then, and it's something that I found interesting, that scholars were doing the exact same thing I'm doing now, meaning that scholars were worried that focusing too much on physical development was going to be a problem in the future for these kids because they were not going to be educated enough. So it's funny to see that humans have always worried about that balance of the mind and the body, and that back then the body was being overdeveloped. And this overdevelopment that was necessary, as I already described, also led to something that we see nowadays, which is vanity. Something that annoyed the scholars as well is that young men were obsessed with the way their body looked, and so they were obsessed with physical development. It's funny, you already had aesthetic bras in like the 1500s, and it never really went away because humans have never really changed. We have the same, uh, the same impetus. 
But what did change, however, is that nowadays there's not as much of a worry when it comes to physical development. So the few people that are going to be completely narcissistic and observe their body in the mirror 15 times a day are a minority. The vast majority of people would much rather not look at themselves at all because their own body disgusts them. So these scholars of the past had the wrong worries, in my opinion, because what happened to us is what they thought would, in a sense, be a good thing. They thought that if people focused on intellect more, it would lead to a good development. And they were sadly wrong. The balance that they wanted to implement made sense, but nowadays that balance has been completely, completely overthrown. And so it is the reason why I think we have so much to learn from these people, because you have to keep in mind that back then, physical development was the norm. We're not even talking about knights right now, or like professional fighters. We're talking about like the average guy. The average guy at a level of physical development that I would attribute nowadays to a dedicated gym rat, meaning that the standard was here. Our standard is way the fuck there, right? Because we have so many people that just pull it down with them who are obese, who are inactive, etc. It didn't exist back then. If you didn't walk, you didn't eat. If you didn't move, you died. So they had no choice and it produced tough individuals. Individuals that, even though they lived in a very uh, difficult environment, didn't die as early as you might think. Many people look at the, the median age of death and they see it's very low and they think, oh, people must have died in their like 20s. But that doesn't take into account the fact that, again, the vast majority of people died in their infancy when they were babies or, because they were, or before they were 20. Meaning that these people drag the median age down. They were individuals that lived into their 60s, 70s and 80s in good health at these times. So... What would you think would happen if you took their physical activity and their focus on the body and you allied it with our modern medicine, modern food, comfort and protection? This should lead to people who are going to live in their, in their hundreds healthy. But of course, it doesn't happen because the very environment that I just cited with the comfort and the protection is the reason why we are not so physically fit anymore is because we don't need to be. But if you're on this channel, you know better than that. You are trying to be fit. And it is my belief that what we're going to be looking at today is going to motivate you to do that with even more intensity. So let's look at it. Let's look at exercising and how it was actually conduced back then. First off, I can tell you that it mostly took place outside. Again, it's this connection with nature. People believed that they were still part of nature because nature was constantly reminding them that they were. So they would exercise outside. They would want to have the sun touch them. That's quite interesting. They would want to be amongst the trees because it was believed to be the place where they belong and they, are, and they thrive. And above what I described about the survival of the species, the reason why people also trained outside of their working hours was, yes, to survive, but also because exercise was considered to be an outlet. It was believed that it was a necessary respite from your everyday life, even from mental activities. This is the reason why, by, by the way, intellectuals of back then also exercised because they gave a break to the spirit by exercising the body. And it's something I preach also. Develop the body, take a break by developing the soul, then take a break and develop the body and do that until the day that you die. This is how to be the perfect man because the perfect man is both a beast and an intellectual. In those days, people were not so much intellectual because, again, there was no availability of knowledge, but their physics were very developed because there weren't many hobbies at the time. If I could strip away all of your hobbies, all of your Instagram and Netflix and Pornhub and all of the garbage that you spend hours on and it's just toxic to you, you would most likely end up just lifting weights or physically developing your body. And it would also become the most pleasurable thing in the world. This is achievable, by the way. It's something that I live, and I'm sure that many people on this channel live, where lifting becomes a pleasure, and it becomes the thing that you love the most in your life, that you have the most pleasure doing, even though it's not a pleasurable activity. It's because you have turned it into your one hobby. Well, back then, everyone was like this, because there was no hobby. It was that or what? Just look at the shadows, look at the sun setting, look at birds. I don't think people were that interested in uh, that sensitivity. So they exercised. Exertion was a hobby for people. 
which is paradoxical because they worked all day. You could think, oh, you worked 10 hours in the field, the last thing you want to do is exercise. But actually, that's not true. It's the way we think nowadays, where we look at work as a punishment. We look at it as a torture, so we can't wait to do nothing. How many people spend eight hours a day on a desk job, and then they go home and they just, they just play pretend on the couch, and they just cosplay as a vegetable? How is that fucking possible? You spent eight hours doing nothing with your body, and now you're going to spend four hours doing that even more? That is the imbalance that makes people miserable. We, as modern men and women, have the most incentive to be in the gym. You should be at your desk just hemped up to finally be able to do some heavy fucking deadlifts because you just, you just sat looking at the screen all day. But I think that, and it's something that verifies itself, laziness breeds laziness. The least you move, the more you let the body just enter a vegetative state, the more it wants to stay that way. Back then, they were constantly active, and that fed the fact that they wanted to also exercise after the day. So that's also something to learn. If you're someone with low energy, look at your ancestors, look at, look at your forefathers. They were constantly in motion. Motion builds motion. And it was also for these people a social event, meaning that people would actually exercise together. There were a community of people who would dance together or wrestle, organize wrestling matches, all things that reinforced the group because it was seen also as a way to fight away the fear. If you can make the entire community stronger as a whole by getting each individual to train, you reinforce the power of the community to defend itself. So it was something that was great on so many levels. Again, it was good psychologically. It was good because it made you tougher. It was good because it reinforced the common cohesion of the group and made the group stronger as a whole. All of that was just a bonus. So of course, it was part of the culture. It was literally part of the European culture of the time, which would greatly strengthen it, by the way. And it wasn't just men. Also, it wasn't just a sausage fest. It wasn't, it wasn't just the dudes at the end of the day who were going to do some curls and bench. The women also trained. And as I said, the men, the, the children also trained. It was important that kids, starting from the young age of 10, start their physical development. And that, in a sense, is the return to the antique education. If you take a look at the way the Greeks educated their kids, the body and the mind were important. We lost sight of it nowadays. When you uh, study the, the ancient Greeks, people mostly talk about philosophers and educated men. But I think it's because we have our own bias. It's also the reason why the modern world is hell-bent on, pa on painting medieval times as just backwards and dirty and dark ages. Is because we don't like the way it reflects on us. Because if you look at it the way I'm doing it right now, it makes us look terrible. We are made into fools by people who apparently are much dumber than us. Same for the ancient Greeks. Physical education was always at the center of the development of children. And so this was also brought back during medieval times, where kids were encouraged to train because they were seen as weak. The weak were the ones that should be training, just like in today's age. The ones that have the most incentive to train are the ones that can benefit the most from him. So it also meant that the kids back then were not coddled or protected. And this application of what could be considered abusive education is what breeds strong individuals. And we're just talking about physical development here, not even psychological treatment. Still to this day, there are studies that show that kids that play outside and are physically active are stronger physically, duh, but also stronger mentally. They are more resilient. They have stronger immune systems. Actually, I read one recently that blew my fucking mind. Well, they were comparing kids growing up on the countryside and kids growing up in cities during the lockdown. And they found that kids on the countryside had twice as much, as much strength in their arms. Twice. It's insane. Just from playing outside. These were not kids who did chin-ups, push-ups, or whatever. They just played outside. Twice as much strength. Imagine how much stronger a kid from the medieval times was. We talk a lot about the fact that testosterone is lowering and men are becoming wimps, etc. There is truth to that, but I don't buy the excuse that it's, it's genetic. Like it's all DNA that devolved. DNA doesn't devolve that fast. What devolved is the culture. What devolved is the way we behave. We still have the potential to be the way our ancestors were when it comes to physical development. We just don't have the incentive and therefore we don't have the fucking balls. It is up to us 
to actually summon it back into our lives. Because, and this is something that was true back then and is still true nowadays, physical training was and still is associated with security and confidence. It was believed that someone who trained their body was well protected for, from attacks and they were going to be more comfortable. See, discomfort bring, uh, breeds comfort. Discipline brings freedom. If you are able to endure the difficulties of life, it's going to make you a better person. And that is something that, it, again, was, was due directly to the positive stigma that was attached to it. Lifting and training was seen as a good thing by the community, so it encouraged people to do it. It's the reason why also it makes my, my blood boil when I see people demonize exercising and they say, oh, it's vain, oh, it's just, it's a waste of time, why are you doing this? Why, if you do that because you think you're not perfect? Yeah, exactly. It's because you're not perfect that you lift and that you train. People back then didn't have all of these ideas in their heads. They just saw something beneficial, they saw it came with a price, and they did it regardless. This was seen as a positive thing. The entire culture saw it as such. And unlike today, again, where labor was seen is seen as debilitating, they back then would embrace it more. They wanted more. And unlike what you might think, the aristocrats, as I said, also did so. The aristocrats are not just sitting in their chairs all day doing nothing. Physical labor, the ability to be, uh, to be actually agile and dynamic, was a quality that the higher class of, of society also embraced. And a good example I have of that is that even kings from back then wrestled. There is an actual historical recounting of a wrestling match between François Ier and Henry VIII where it was said that François Ier, François I, tossed around Henry VIII. Kings, people of such high power, were still physically active. Nowadays, look at the state of society. Look at the people that dominate us, that, that direct us, the politicians. How many of them are physically active? Out of 100 politicians, maybe, maybe five or six are going to be slightly athletic, slightly. The vast majority, they look like melted candles. They have the athletic abilities of a corpse. Why? Because we have stopped putting the emphasis on physical development. Back then, if you were a king and you were not physically capable, people would not follow you. They would think, okay, why exactly am I going to follow someone who's weaker than me, who's not going to be able to fight and protect the kingdom? That's bullshit. I'm not going to do that. They represented the ideal. They represented the legends. Imagine having a king that is such a fucking chad that he wrestles another king and he just fucks him up. Imagine if your politician had a boxing match with another politician and he won. Wouldn't you feel proud about this? Or would you be the type to say, oh, it's, no, it's violence, it's beneath us. If you think like this, you are poisoned by modernity. In 1369, board games were forbidden in favor of physical activity. So the king edicted a treaty saying, hey, stop playing fucking checkers and do push-ups, you dirty peasants. I want to see pecs. I want to see bulging biceps. Next time I come down and I inspect the village, I want to see quads so big that it makes me want to puke. Can you imagine laws like this nowadays? Can you imagine if you're the politicians of your country addicted to a law banning fast food, banning, I don't know, masturbation, banning video games and saying, okay, we'll replace all of that with physical education. You're going to run laps and you're going to do chin-ups. How much would your country improve? Honestly, yeah, it would be dictatorial, it's authoritative. Yeah, maybe, but it would improve the life of everyone. Back then, they still had the executive power to do things like this, so they did. And this was what led also to, again, the Knights, the best of the best. So, perk up your ears because there is much to learn from what were considered back then to be the perfect examples of men. Keep in mind, for now, we've only been talking about the common folk. Now, we're going to talk about the elite, the people who were just doing exercising all day. Their entire life was exercising. It wasn't just something they did on the side. It was their existence. They were the strongest men of their time, both on and off the battlefield. A knight wasn't just physically dominant when he was fighting other knights. He was dominant everywhere. It's the same for you. You might be a beast in the gym, but when you go outside of the gym, your muscles and your strength don't just disappear. 
And the confidence that comes with it also doesn't go anywhere. You carry it with you. Imagine the aura of authority that these men possessed back then. It must have been tremendous. These were not just really advanced humans in the realm of physical strength. These were superhumans, but we're going to get back to it. So, how do you get to become a knight? How do you get to go from common man to knight, which is the step above? Well, it was through phases. If you know anything about knighthood, there were certain ranks that you had to enter and certain jobs you had to work. For example, you had to be a page for a certain amount of years. You had to be a sire for a certain amount of years, and then you, can, you could become a knight at the age of 21. But usually by the time you became a knight, you had at least 10 years of experience in your back pocket. And that was years of manual labor, hard work, of taking orders, of accepting that life is going to suck for a while, because this is what breeds, again, strong men. If you take a kid and you make them go through nothing for, for years at a time, with just full of comfort and protection, what do you have at the end? You have just you have a, a, someone who is going to be limp. You have someone who is going to be uncooked because you refuse to put them through the fire. Back then, fire was everywhere. Nowadays, we extinguished it and we call it progress. So, these were the stages where a knight would learn hard work and they would also have to conquer a rite of passage. A rite of passage which, by the way, just like myths and legends, can be found in every single culture on earth. Every culture that is not completely devoid of any masculinity has rites of passages where you had to earn your manhood to be accepted as a man, to go from boy to man. You have to do something tremendous. In Africa, you have to hunt a lion. In Europe, you had to do this. If you wanted to be a knight, you have to go through all of these stages. Now, can you cite me the rite of passage of your country? Does your country have a rite of passage that turns boys into men? I can tell you that in France, we don't. We used to have le service militaire, meaning that you had to spend a few, I think it was just months, not even years, maybe, maybe years, maybe two years. You had to spend two years doing military service to learn about life, to learn about what it takes to actually go through struggle, etc., etc. Nowadays, it's been replaced. So what is the rite of passage of the French? Exactly what it is. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember having to take any. The every, every single rite of passage that still exists nowadays are ones that you are going to enter yourself. But for them, for the knights, it was something that was obligatory. They had to do it. And as they did it, they became knights and they entered the Brotherhood of Knights, which was something, again, voluntary. An interesting fact about that, something that many people also don't know, is that, is that becoming a knight would grant you nobility. So it was a way to break glass ceilings and advance in society. Someone who was born a peasant, if they proved themselves and they went through the proper stages, could become a knight. And then their nobility would be passed down on their children. So you could, you could experiment social mobility and class mobility by actually putting in the work. <clears throat> so it was based on merit. It was a meritocracy. But interestingly enough, not all nobles were knights. The opposite was not true. Just because you were born a noble didn't mean that you were a knight. No one got a free pass. You had to actually put in the effort if you wanted to be knighted, meaning that many nobles were not knights. But many kings, especially in France, were knights, meaning that even the king had to pay and, and pave his way through. And why would a king want to become a knight? Well, it was because it was a status symbol. These people were seen as the best of the best. So even someone who was born the best, born the leader, still wanted to be able to call himself, himself a knight. Anyone could become a knight. It didn't stay that way, but at the start, that's what it was. You will see that it evolved afterwards, which led to the devolution of knighthood. But at the start, it was a meritocracy that would accept pretty much anyone brave or strong enough. It was, it was an order that said, okay, we are looking for strength. If you are strong and you are willing to put yourself at the service of the weak, we want you. It's, it went to the point that in France, they would recruit people that came from countries that were, they were actively fighting. Meaning that if you were, for example, what we call a Sarrazin, meaning from a Muslim empire, even though these were sworn enemies of France, we still have to this day documents 
that prove that some knights came from these countries and were still accepted as French knights because they had strength. The only thing that was required was that. And so this meant that we already had a group of individuals that by their work and outside of their birth managed to prove that they were above the rest. And because of that, they were called, what I said previously, les plus comme, literally in French, superhumans. Those were actually living superhumans. And it's why I insisted at the start about myths and legends. Nowadays, we regard these legends with a bit of, of circumspection and even skepticism, thinking, okay, that's greatly exaggerated. But then you look at knights. A knight from back then is a male power fantasy for us. But these guys were real. So keep in mind one thing. Even though the legends they followed might have been greatly embellished, it still led to the creation of powerhouses of masculinity. This is something to keep in mind because as you listen to the way these knights train and the lives that they led, you will also be faced with the realization that it's so much higher than that what we are now. But it doesn't stop the fact that it should be used as inspiration. So, what exactly was the life of a knight back then? What were the requirements to be a proper knight? First off, you need to own a, 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 a horse, you need to have your own armor and your own sword. And it wasn't just a question of property. It was also a question of having the ability to carry these things on your back because a knight would be in armor with the sword whenever he fought for days at a time, which meant that they had to be incredibly muscularly resistant. If I put a weighted vest on your back with 20 pounds, how long before you have to take it off? Well, if you take it off within 20 minutes or even two hours, you wouldn't have had what it took to be a knight back then. Because the way they did it is that to train their resilience, they would put on their armor and they would go for a jog. They would go for a walk with, with everything on their back, which of course tended to stimulate a terrifying appetite. If you look at the way knights ate back in the days, they ate a ton of meat, they ate a ton of, of cheese, they ate everything you put in, in front of their face. Animal products, they ate fat, they ate proteins. There was scarcely any vegetables present on the tables back then, but it's because their expenditure and their physical activity was so great that their diet were also out of the norm. Also, they were not super, super concerned about health back then. What they cared about the most was to be able to satiate themselves and to be able to put in the hard work. Which also meant that there was, in a sense, a limiting factor to who could become a knight. It was a meritocracy, but if you didn't have what it took in terms of the ability to procure enough food to feed yourself and the time to train, then it was tough to become a knight because the knight was the perfect machine. They truly were. And a perfect machine cannot go without fuel and it cannot go without execution, without the ability to run all day. But the reason why it was so important that knights were so physically strong was because they were the shield of the weak. Knights were supposed to be of such immense power because the people they protected were plenty and they were also completely defenseless, even though they were still physically active, the peasants and everything, they lacked the ability to protect themselves with weapon. And that is when the knights came in. So to make up for the lack of strength of these people, theirs had to be that much greater. And if you observe ancient manuscripts of the time, for example, Le Livre des Fées, the Boussico for my French readers who might be interested in actually perusing the document, you can learn from their physical development and the training methods that they use. As I said, what they particularly liked to do is to put on their armor that weighed between 50 and 70 pounds and go for a run or go for a hike or a jog, sometimes for miles, which would, of course, greatly reinforce your back and your legs and, of course, also your cardiovascular system, which meant that the physique of these knights must have been greatly developed. Sadly, we don't really have any depictions of the way they looked shirtless because of a certain level of puritanism of the time where the depictions of humans were mostly clothed. But from descriptions we get from literature and from La Chanson de Geste, we know that these were not skinny dudes. Most of the time when knights are described, they have broad shoulders, very developed arms and legs, a thin waist and a developed chest and core. 
It's always the points that come back the most, with, of course, a wide and thick back. And that is no surprise when you see the amount of work they had to do. For example, also, jumping on a horse without any help, wearing armor. They were not allowed to utilize any stabilizing method to jump on the horse. They had to do it with the armor on their back. You need tremendous power to do that. And they even did variations. These guys understood that if they wanted to get stronger at the one thing, they had to utilize something that was in the same line of specificity, which is the reason why I say that programming is natural. Every single class and, and breed of strong and big men programmed. They just didn't know it. Back then, what they would do as a variation of this is they would climb on the, sh on the, on the, on the horse using only one arm. So they would grab around the head, the head of the horse, they would grab onto something, and they would pull themselves like this. Of course, they had big arms. That's extremely impressive, especially with an armor on your back. They would also hit heavy things, as described by Le Livre des Fers. And when you look at that, at first, I, th I thought that they were like cutting trees or even just trying, like cutting wood. It's, it goes deeper than that. The way it's described in the book is frapper quelque chose de gros. So quite literally, hit something big. Meaning that they usually just grabbed an axe or grabbed any amount of stick or sword. They found one thing they could just decimate and they just hit it. From top to bottom, vertical pull all day every day. That, of course, would also greatly develop your upper back. Just like nowadays, people who cut wood also develop their upper back with that method. And that's all of the exercises that managed to turn them into the powerhouses that they were, where the, your average man was already athletic and physically developed, and the knights were just a grade above, because they were supposed to represent the best of humanity, and that was both with their body and their soul. They could not allow anyone to best them. That was the mentality back then. And they were not the stoic depictions that we see nowadays. Sometimes when you look at certain series, the way knights are presented is, they are very serious, they never crack a joke, they are sometimes depicted as very skinny. From what we see of the text, it wasn't the case. Knights were exuberant, they were full of vitality, and they wanted to share it. And it was, it was developed and uh, presented also by, again, their diets, where they would stuff their faces. Guarantee you that a knight back then ate thousands and thousands of calories a day, because they had a very high caloric expenditure. But it went also beyond that. It said in the text that knights liked to go shirtless, even in the court, just to flex, to, just to show people, hey, it's minus 10 and I'm freezing my nipples off, but I don't give a fuck, look at my biceps. This was a thing back then, and it's still a thing today. Truly, it shows that men never really change. We always have the same inclinations, and we always have the same idea of what it means to be powerful, of being able to show off your strength. This back then was just saying, well, I don't give a fuck about the weather, I am the weather. I cannot be beat. So just feast your eyes upon my muscles. It's also the reason why when they weren't wearing armors, knights were for the most part wearing very tight and revealing clothing. So it's not just limited to Gymshark models. Although back then they didn't have all of the extra exogenous hormone help. So that was for the training, but it wasn't just the story of big and strong men who hit heavy things and stuff their face. Those guys also did calisthenics, and that's something that's well known, but knights did pull-ups. And not just any pull-ups, they did weighted pull-ups, meaning that what they would do is they would either put a ladder on top of a wall, and they would climb that explosively, two hands at a time. You know the, the salmon ladder that you see in certain climbing gyms nowadays? They used to do that with their armor on. So that's essentially an explosive pull-up with a controlled negative, for reps and reps at a time with progressive overload because they could add pieces of armor to make it harder. So you could only imagine the size of the lats of these guys back then. They must have had pretty big bags. They also would climb up towers without any protection whatsoever, of course. And they also did unilateral climbs with only one arm. So again, variations. Knights were doing variations. I could make a medieval training program if you guys want it, because I, from this, have enough information. We also know that knights did handstand push-ups, knights did vertical presses with rocks in their hands. They were essentially training the way we train now without the equipment. Resistance training was already a thing back then. It's incredible. 
and that participated in the effort of developing the body and the mind. It wasn't just the mind. The two came hand in hand. And I think that the reason why nowadays the common person is also degenerating on a moral and spiritual level is because their body is rotting. It's the reason why I think that putting the body at the center of everything is a good idea. If this starts to fall apart, this will fall apart as well, and vice versa. So, this is also the reason why these physical capacities translated into moral values of bravery, loyalty, generosity, and courtesy. The knights were not limited to a big and powerful physique. The physique was built so as to help them protect the weak. And that also came through again, their set of moral values, bravery, the ability to put yourself forth in the, in the face of danger to never falter. That was incredibly important. It's also interesting to look at what loyalty meant back then because social links and the connections between people were based off of willingness, meaning that you associated with a community because you wanted to. It was all a question of cohesion and also of community, of a true community where people wanted to be around another and therefore the knights were willing to die for the people that they protected because this was the way they were living their loyalty. The feudal system is... Again, completely misunderstood by modernity. I'm not going to go into too much of a tirade. You could research it yourself if you want it. But the idea that the peasants were enslaved and that the knights were just soldiers at the service of the king without a soul, all of that is mostly proven untrue nowadays, where the villagers and the people who worked for the king, for the most part, wanted to because they got protection from the king. And the knights were willing, again, to spend and extend their strength in order to facilitate that because... It allowed them to serve. Nothing pleases a knight more than serving. That also translates into their generosity. A knight was supposed to be generous. They were actually, they were said to be spenders. They would just burn their money off. They would just spend as much as they could because it was seen as being a miser and being of, of lowly stature and status in royalty to accumulate wealth. Accumulating wealth was not well perceived back then. It was something that another caste, la bourgeoisie, was doing. And we see where that led them. They are very powerful still to this day. And knights have disappeared because the knights always refused to do that. They would expand. They would buy food for the village. They would buy new swords. They would buy dogs. They would go hunting. It wasn't very smart. It's the tale of la fourmi. I was going to say la fourmi et la cigogne. La fourmi et la cigale. But it also speaks to the level of virtue that they had, and that was important if you wanted to be part of the order. They were also very cautious, being that they were protecting the weak, and they were also, of course, putting their strength at the service of women, of their ladies. Which tend to be traits that all healthy societies should uphold. And usually when the traits of bravery, loyalty, generosity, etc. go away, you end up with what we have nowadays, which is... Societies where people are not happy with themselves, not happy with the group, and therefore the country as a whole is unhappy. And if we go back to what I said at the start, all of that could be fixed by physical development. Because it is their physical development that led the knights to have the values that they had. Once you develop a, a strong and big body, it is my opinion that if you did it properly, your spirituality has developed as well. It's almost impossible to just be a big hunk of muscle naturally without having a philosophy that comes with it. Because on the journey, you are going to learn. And on their journeys, the knights also learn as well. It is my belief that the evolution of the knights reflected that of civilization back then. It is the ultra-violent hood that was the pre-knighthood that became and turned into a sanitized one by the very codes that were put in place for knighthood to exist in the first place. Back then, the strength of these men had to be contained. That's what being a knight was. The reason why knights were needed in the first place, as I said, is because there were bands of bandits and constant war going on, targeted at the peasants. So, a certain order of men decided to put their strength at the service of these people to defend them and they would get something in return. That is the feudal system summed up in five seconds. And these men had to abide by codes, again, to catalyze all of their violent energy so as to utilize it. This is, with big quotation marks, healthy masculinity. It's masculinity that is contained, a masculinity that is controlled and put at the service of whatever it wishes to protect. The only shield against toxic, 
masculinity and aggressiveness and gratitude violence is masculinity itself. And back in the days, they perfectly understood that. The knight was the best example of masculinity at the time. But sadly, the codes that tamed these rough men cannot be applied to us anymore because we lack the very bestial energy that necessitated the code in the first place. If you push bravery, loyalty, courtesy on a modern man, you're going to end up with an abomination because these things only make sense when seen through the scope of strength. If they are applied to mediocre people, they turn into sins. They turn into traits that you don't actually want to see in a man. The order of, of knighthood died because the ability to earn knighthood by your own merit was slowly replaced by lineage and nobility, meaning that there came a time where men, even men of great power, were not allowed to become knights. The only people that were allowed to become knights were noble men. And so the people that had potential to become superhumans were pushed aside. And the ability for class mobility I described previously was stifled. And this is how the order died. It's the reason why knights were just completely replaced at some point. Other factors also play a role in the operation of the gun, for example. But if you look at the values that this order represented, these shouldn't have died. Even if the occupation of being a knight disappears, why did the values go away? Why did the physical activity go away? Well, all of that went away because there was no incentive anymore again. Men would develop their strength so as to put it to the service of others. But if suddenly you're told that your strength doesn't matter anymore and your accomplishments don't matter anymore and everything is given by default to someone who was born as such, then it is certain that the potential and the quality of this order in general is going to eventually degrade and disappear. It is the time where the aristocrats and the upper class stopped exercising and it was seen as something lesser. When the aristocracy started to focus more on purity of form over results, this is when things started to go south. This is when the very existence of that order that motivated men to become bigger started to die off. It started to also wash off the rest of society because, as I said, physical activity was being demonized more and more. And with the advance of progress, there was more comfort, there was less of an incentive, and so it slowly disappeared. When violence, discomfort, and pain disappeared, all of the things that it created as a response had to disappear as well. And that also is the case with those rites of passage. Sadly, we now live in an age that is entirely devoid of that. And if you look around you, you might find that there's not much danger available and that there are many ways for you to avoid pain. But if you are true to yourself, you're also going to notice that this doesn't make you happy. And so there can be only one answer. It's the very nature of man that gave birth to the knights. Even throughout the evolution of the ages, when the codes of chivalry evolved, the person that followed them was always the same guy. And that guy was the man. From the time where he was a barbarian to when he was actually a Christian, a devout Christian, it was still the same guy, just with a different code of morals. And it's also why I believe that we can learn from them because you are also the same guy. It's just that the environment that you have and the things that were pushed on you as a kid is what might be shackling your potential. You still have that vibrant masculinity in you. It's just that you're incapable of tapping into it because, again, where you live and what you have become is not conducive to it. But knowing that you still have that heart beating in your chest should be enough to motivate you to actually get it pumping again. And that is going to conclude this video. I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.